Okay, just a quick summary of how we construct <coughs> a graph of the sine function. We start with a circle and we create an axis and we extend that axis. And we're going to build the graph on this axis. And then we do another axis perpendicular to this one. That axis is not going to appear on this graph. We can impose it later wherever we want to, but we're not going to impose an axis on this graph. Uh, we're just going to get, in other words, a curve built on this line. And the way we do that, well, let's see. We've already got the circle divided into four equal arcs. Okay, we got an arc from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here. So we want to divide each of these arcs into two equal arcs. And that's easily done by geometric construction. Everything we're doing here can be done by geometric construction. So uh, we first divide this arc into two, and we use a compass and straight edge to do that, at least theoretically. And we're going to get something uh, about here. Okay? Uh, then we can, and I, actually I've got that a little too far along here, I think. Yeah, it looks pretty good, actually. Okay, it's a little hard to see from this angle. So we divide the circle here. Now, we create our graph. Uh, as follows. Okay, uh, We've divided the circle into four equal arcs, and then we've subdivided the arc uh, at least in the first quadrant. And of course, we could do the same thing in each of the other quadrants. Now, what we do here is we start with some interval of the x-axis, and we subdivide that the same way we subdivide the circle. So we have subdivided the circle into four equal parts, so we subdivide this interval into four equal parts. And again, we can do that with compass and straight edge. Just find the uh, midpoint of this segment. Let me draw an arc here uh, from this point, draw an arc, equal arc from this point, and a straight line through the points where those arcs meet, and you get a line through this point. So that's going to be the bisector. And you can then bisect this segment to get this, bisect this segment to get this. Now, I haven't actually constructed that. These aren't going to be particularly accurate. I'm just kind of eyeballing these. So I'm going to be off. But you get the idea. Now, we're in the first quadrant, so we've divided that quadrant into two parts. So, well, I then divide this interval into two parts, subdivide it, bisect it. Okay, um, now let's plot a couple of points. Okay, well, if we think of starting at this point and going in the counterclockwise direction and starting at this point and moving to the right, we at this point locate a point whose distance from this line, this horizontal line that I've drawn here, is the same as the distance of this point from the horizontal line. Of course, now this point is on the horizontal line. Distance is zero. So this point has to be at distance zero from the horizontal line. So there we are. Then at this point, we construct a point. We can do this geometrically. Uh, we would have to start by uh, constructing a perpendicular from this point to this line. And then we can extend a line segment from here to here as far as we want to. And we could then, having constructed that, project this out to the point where it's at least above this point, and then construct the perpendicular here to this line, and we get a point on our graph, which is at the same distance from this point as this point is from, uh, let, let's say, it's at the same distance from our horizontal line as this point, but it lies above this point here. Okay, then we do the same thing here. If you already know this, this is already getting tedious, but uh, we're going to be here. And that can all be constructed. Now, at this point, we've got a pretty good template for constructing an arc an arc with a sine curve, okay? But we're going to make it a little more precise. We're going to 
divide this into two parts. I'm going to divide this into two parts. That is, we're going to bisect uh, this arc. We're going to bisect this arc by bisecting the angle uh, in a way that you should understand quite well. And then we're going to project uh, this over here and this one up here. We're going to get a point here. We're going to project this over here and then project up here. So we're going to get a point here. And we can continue this. We subdivide again. And we get points here, 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 here. Um, I'm not going to draw all the projections, but we're going to get a point about here and a point up here and a point up here. Not drawing these very accurately, but something like this. And we can see the trend of our curve becoming more and more precise. So this could be continued as long as we wish. And when we're done, we're going to have a set of points. If we continue this far enough, the points here are going to blend into one another, and they're going to give us a nice smooth curve, something like this. Now, we've only divided the first quadrant. We could easily, based on that construction, use a straight edge to construct a line through this point and the origin down to here. So that would give us a point here. And then we could mark this distance from the axis if we wanted to come over here an equal distance, uh, do this, or we could extend this dotted line here over here to get this point. Uh, one way or another, bring this uh, through the origin to get this point. And we could do the same sort of thing for every one of our points in the first quadrant to construct the corresponding points in the other quadrants. <coughs> now, I'm not going to fill that in, but you understand how that would look. Okay, well, if we want to extend the curve, you know, the arc keeps going, we could extend the curve to match this quadrant. And the symmetry of the situation is, as we move from here, we repeat the distances from the horizontal line, which we could think of as y value, but I don't want to bring that terminology into it right now. Uh, these distances repeat in reverse. In other words, as we go this way, we get this, 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 this in reverse order of the way it was done here. And without being more precise about that, I don't want to state everything uh, in excruciating detail. I want you to think about things a little bit. But you can understand, if you think about it, that since these values here are going to repeat, all we really need to do to construct this part of the curve is to reflect all of these points through this line. Now, we have more detailed constructions, and I have more detailed explanations in case you don't get that. Um, but I'm only going to reflect uh, a couple of the points. I'm going to reflect this point. Okay. To do that, we'd have to construct a line perpendicular to this one. But this line being perpendicular to this line, I didn't state that, but it's implicit. Um, means that the line that we already constructed, this projection line here that we used to construct this point, could just be extended. And then we just have to use our compass, get my hand out of the way, to mark this distance. And we have a point at equal distance on the other side along a, perpendic a line perpendicular to this line. In other words, this point is the reflection of this point. And then we can similarly reflect the other points. Okay, we can reflect this one. We can reflect this one. Cheating a little bit. Uh, and I'm not going to sketch them all in. But now we have 
a good way to sketch this part of the curve. We can then get kind of clever if we think about the way things go here. Everything, this whole curve has to repeat upside down. And it turns out that that can be done by reflecting every point. And let me just kind of draw a nice bright red point here. By reflecting every point here through this point, meaning that we can, and let me match up colors, Okay, we can sketch a straight line here through this point and this point. And I'm going to actually have to extend that line a little further. And I'm not doing a very good job of that. But then we can use our compass to mark this distance and mark an equal distance here. And we're going to get a point down here. Okay. Now I'm not going to do that for all the points. I'll just do it for a couple more. We do the same thing for this point. And that line didn't go far enough, but I'll fix that in a minute. And while I've got this color, we're going to draw a line for this point. Okay. I'm going to extend this line a little bit. Now, we measure this distance here gives us a point about here. And then we measure this distance along this line gives us a point about here. Now, if we continue that, and I'll kind of leave that for you to continue. Because again, I've done this in much more detail elsewhere. We're going to get a curve that uh, yeah, I'm having trouble seeing through my arm, my arm being somewhat opaque. Uh, but we're going to get a curve that gives us the upside down curve here if we do that accurately. Okay, so that's our construction of the sine function. Now let's talk a little bit more about what the implications of this process are. If we continue this subdivision until we do get something that looks like a continuous curve, have we really defined the sine curve? Now we've got a pretty good definition. It pretty much tells us where the sine curve has to be, but we haven't done infinitely many points. Okay, Even if we continue this forever, um, if we could, if we define the sine function graph as what you get if you continue this process forever, do you really get a complete graph of the sine function? That's a kind of a theoretical mathematical question that's kind of interesting. So we're going to continue to talk about that.